afternoon. Yep, just cattail right now. <laughs> You like to sit just out of frame, don't you, bud? We'll give it a minute for folks to sign on because the first thing we're going to do is a group activity, and obviously it'll work a little better if more people are here. So, All right, people are still rolling in, so we'll give it another minute or so before we get going. You don't need to knock over the whole stand. You don't. Sorry, I'm talking to Simba for those of you who just signed on. I swear I don't hear voices, but he likes to just knock things off my desk. So let's, because he's a cat. <laughs> There's nothing inside my monitor. So scratching at it doesn't do anything but scratch my monitor. Okay, why don't you lay down? You can leave too, that's fine. Just realized like, I'm recording this, so that all's gonna go on YouTube. That'd be great. I'll look really mentally stable. <laughs> And as you come in, I'm just checking you off again on my in case academic affairs ask me about anybody list, essentially. All righty. So today we're going to start off with our first group activity um, and I'm going to share screen to show it to you really quickly. Just so you know, so I'm going to put the link for this in the chat um, so you'll be able to access it and um, I'm planning to put you in either four or five group or five or six groups, depending on how many people are actually here. Um, and so at the top I have, it's uh, the assignment refers you to the box in your book, but just in case people didn't have their books yet, I did my very high tech way of scanning, which is I took a cell phone picture and put it on here um, so that you could refer to the box from the book here. And then just which when you are assigned to a group by Zoom, it will tell you like you're joining breakout room one or five, take note of that number because then what you'll do is you'll come in and work off the worksheet for your group. Uh, so you have five questions to answer together. Uh, I'm gonna give y'all 20 minutes. That seems to be around the magic number people need for these types of assignments. If for some reason you do it really quickly, you can talk with your group about other stuff in the chapter, or if everyone feels like you're done halfway through, uh, just let me know when we can finish early. So let me go ahead and stick. All right, I need to stop screen sharing here. I'm trying to do too many things at once. All right, I'm going to uh, stick the link to that in the chat. I'll give you all a minute to get that open while I get the groups set up. So I will do six groups. Each group should have three to four people in it, which is a good amount. And let me just make sure all the options are set up right. Yes, you'll have 20 minutes and then you'll get a 60 second countdown before it closes uh, to work through those five questions together. Obviously the 20 minutes is also to give you time to read over that box. So if you do have your book with you, I have page numbers, so you don't have to scroll back up and down to read it. Um, but if you don't have your book yet, 
the box is uh, photographed there. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open the rooms. When that happens, go ahead and uh, just hit accept and you will be taken to your rooms. And remember, there's that question mark if you need me in the rooms. And again, before you accept your invitation, make sure you click on the link for the Google Doc so you can have it open and everyone should be able to view it and edit it. So I'm going to open the rooms. Alrighty, everybody, welcome back. Hopefully your first breakout experience went well. Um, so there were five questions, but we have six groups. Um, so what I will do is, um, I feel like I always start with group one and then like the last group gets screwed. So what I'm gonna do is start with group two and then group one, you get to choose which of the questions you want to add on to at the end. So we'll do that. Um, and so for the first question, uh, what psychological issues do you think Podar was dealing with? So this is group two, it looks like it was CJ, Casita, Jackie, and Steven. So you can either have just one of you talk or all of you can talk however you all want to do it. I can do it. Um, so pretty much in the text, it really doesn't give you much other than he was inexperienced in romantic relationships. He began to become confused with Tatiana's on off again behavior with him and he became infatuated with her. So with those kind of pulling themselves together, we kind of figured that maybe that could be some type of bipolar disorder, which came from an antisocial disorder or with that infatuation in there, that could be maybe a possible attachment disorder issue that he had developing growing up. So any of those things, it, I mean, it's hard to really determine from what they give us. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is hard, right? And I, I appreciate that recognition. Um, and, you know, sometimes you're in a room with someone and it's hard to figure out what's going on with them. Um, so, yeah, clearly some um, emotional instability, right? Uh, so maybe something with like bipolar disorder, maybe something like a personality disorder or an attachment disorder, lots of different options, but clearly someone who was disturbed, right? Um, I've been talking in my abnormal class about what is abnormality, right? And I think by most definitions, it'd be pretty easy to classify him as, you know, abnormal, right? Because most people don't go around killing their exes, even if there's times people want to, right? So yeah, yeah, definitely a lot going on. All right, so group three, uh, which was Carly, Emily, Autumn, and Michaela. Um, what would you have done differently if you were the therapist in this case? Um, so we kind of had a hard time with this because we feel like the therapist like kind of followed what had like previously been done a lot of the time. Like there wasn't really any precedence for like a situation like this. So um, we kind of said that like, she, I mean, she could have told Tatiana and like warned her about it. Um, we also said she could have contacted like a larger law enforcement agency rather than just like campus police. And maybe they could have like detained him or got like him more help for a longer amount of time rather than just like campus security pulling up and making him promise that he wouldn't hurt someone. <laughs> yeah, and that's a really good point. Um, I'm not sure if the box makes this clear. Obviously, it's a very short summary, but uh, so some campuses are like us and just have like a private security, right? And then some campuses actually have police stations with trained police officers. And I think that was the case here. Um, so they should be able to do what any other police officer could do. Um, that doesn't always mean 
they can or will do something about it, to be honest, just depending on resource availability, things along those lines. So yeah, I think that that's a really good point. Yeah, and I mean, I don't remember if the box makes this clear or not. I think it just sort of mentions it in passing, but his therapist was a student, right? She was being supervised by somebody else. So I can't even imagine like if I was in grad school and one of my clients had gone and like killed someone else, like you would feel so guilty, so awful, right? But as you said, Carly, like she was operating within what she thought she could do, right? She didn't know she could do more than that, just based on our ethical principles and ideas about confidentiality. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a really good point. Alrighty, so group five, um, does the court decision in this case seem reasonable to you? So this is Annika, Kenzie, and Danny. Um, um, we just said that uh, the court decision does seem reasonable because it holds counselors of like psychological patients accountable for their actions um, and what their patients go through with like while they're under their care. But it makes the therapists and counselors more involved and aware of their patients as well as it like ensures the authorities are informed if needed for like potential harm or risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and this is one that I would say is still maybe a little bit controversial in psych today. Like some people still feel like this is overstepping our bounds, but other people fully acknowledge that like this is a really important step to protect the public, right? Um, and clearly you wouldn't do this casually. <laughs> so you wouldn't just go out and be like, well, you know, this person made a joke and so I'm gonna go and like inform their ex about it, right? This would be like, there's a credible threat right to themselves or to someone else um so yeah really good point Alrighty, and then group six naila tacy and jordan um uh, what other situations can you imagine where a therapist may have a duty to warn someone of a potential risk by a client besides a physical attack hi okay so we said that the therapist would also have the duty to warn someone if the client expresses physical harm to themselves um, or even like mental harm to themselves, just any kind of self-harm. Um, they can also warn the parents or guardians if they are underage, if they feel this way. Um, and if the client has any emergency contacts and they're above age, this would also be a case of an emergency. So we feel like um, if the clients are in danger of, um, of attacking themselves or if they feel like they are in danger themselves of somebody else, retaliating against them or expressing any kind of harm. Yeah, I think that, yeah, definitely threat of harm to themselves is a huge one. And as a therapist, you might even contact the police at that point to escort them if you don't have an inpatient facility on site. Yeah, and because of like, we don't know how stable the client's mental state is. So even if they only get verbal retaliation, we don't know what that could do to them mentally and cause them to spiral down. And as the therapist, it's our responsibility to keep the client intact for the most part. Definitely, yeah. So in those scenarios, as a therapist, what you try to do is what's called a contract for safety. Um, although there's different ideas about how you should do this. Um, but this is what I was taught is like, you literally have them fill out a contract saying, I won't harm myself or this other person between now and our next session. And here are three things I can do if I feel like I'm going to do that. Um, so it might be like call a friend, things like that. Um, and if they can't sign that form, that's when you involuntarily hospitalize them at that point in time. Um, yeah, yeah, so it can be obviously a tricky situation. All right, so I'm gonna bounce back up to group one, Greta, Sherelle, Aaron, and Lilia. Um, and have you all fill in any place you have something more to add on any of the five questions or anything you might've disagreed with that the other group said? I think for the most part, we agree with them. Um, I remember like we definitely talked about the campus police thing and yeah, I think they kind of covered it all. I think like another thing was 
even like without the campus police or like police, if they didn't like exactly know like what to do in this situation, they could have informed like some type of administration to let them know that this girl could possibly be in danger and just like go about that with like either rehousing her, or, like informing someone to make sure that like she's always with someone out in public and just like making sure that they're taking precautions so that if it is worst case scenario, which it was, that like she wouldn't have been harmed. This actually happened to my basketball team when I was in grade school. And yeah, it was crazy. A guy made like a hit list of all the girls in my um, grade. And it was like what order he was gonna kill them and how. And they took like, I think the top 10 girls and hid them in the principal's office. And because I guess like we didn't really have, like it was a middle school. So we had like one police officer. So that's what they did. Terrifying, oh my gosh. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, this type of scenario unfortunately does happen, especially domestic type relationship type situations. Um, so when I first got here, the president's assistant, so I think it's Kelly who's in that position now, but she was um, an older woman who'd been here for quite some time. She retired a couple of years after I got here. She was like the sweetest woman, so helpful. Um, and what I found out eventually is that her daughter had had a scenario like this where her daughter's either current or ex-boyfriend came to her dorm room and killed her and then killed himself. Um, so these things unfortunately do happen, right? Yeah, and so you want to be able to warn them. Yeah, you know, it's sort of tricky to wrap your head around what other scenarios could this happen in, right? Um, and like, what is your duty to warn then? So like, I remember in my grad school ethics class talking about, you know, what if you know someone who's HIV positive and they tell you they're gonna have unprotected sex and not tell the other person they're positive, right? Do you have to get the other person's info and let them know then since that could, you know, potentially be fatal. Um, you know, in the era of coronavirus, if someone tells you you're gonna walk around without a mask, right? Like, what do you do then? Um, you know, obviously try to convince them of things, but yeah so you all are thinking about things in really good ways i think and again this is there's not always clear-cut answers and that's the reason why we have the court system right the justice system to go through this and make these decisions and what they try to be a fair way we want to fully acknowledge it's not always fair um i did a little uh, introduction in my abnormal class today that I will echo in here. Um, this is Black History Month, so we need to fully recognize that certainly the legal system, but also the field of psychology has not always been fair and equitable and is not always necessarily fair and equitable right now. Um, the field of psychology has a horrible history. To be perfectly honest, there were psychologists who were eugenicists. There were psychologists who were involved uh, in the torture program that the CIA developed in the early 2000s. Um, you know, and uh, the, the legal system certainly has been implicated in a whole host of things, but most prominent uh, that has, at least recently has been the racial bias, right? And who gets released, who gets bail, who gets killed, let's be perfectly honest, right? Um, and so we need to fully acknowledge that going forward um, and uh, hope that we continue to do better. I know within the field of psychology, we're really trying. So last year when the pandemic hit and when everything happened with George Floyd, the APA president uh, released, I should just not sure, but when George Floyd was murdered by that police officer, like let's tell things what they are, right? Um, yeah, uh, just like I call the incident that happened on January 6th domestic terrorism, because that's what it was. Um, but uh, the APA president came out and said, we have an epidemic of racism in the US. And that's certainly not something I would have said, I think really even five years ago. Um, but we had a, uh, a female president and a black CEO then. Now we have a female black president and a black CEO of APA. Um, so I think that makes a big difference in how you react, like representation matters, right? And we know that unfortunately, because of the systemic racism within our society, we don't get people of color in those upper echelons, particularly within the justice system, right? And academia is just as guilty. Uh, yeah, the APA president this year is a black lady, and then our CEO is a black guy, and he has been for several years, and he's great. I've seen him on several things. 
Um, so an APA is not squeaky clean. APA has all kinds of problems. I want to put that out there. But they're certainly trying. They have a, a movement within it called Equity Flattens the Curve that is really looking at racial inequalities in diagnosis and uh, deaths by COVID. Um, in my uh, WGS class last semester, we read an article about the racial disparities and deaths, and I didn't realize quite how bad it was. So in the state of New Mexico, I believe, it was Native Americans make up like 3% of their population, but they made up 75% of their deaths. Um, so, you know, we recognize that these exist and I want to fully acknowledge that going forward that some of what I'm going to be talking about um, is just the levels of things uh, in terms of, you know, definitional and whatnot, but always acknowledging that this stuff doesn't always work perfectly. And we know that and some of the stuff we're going to watch really acknowledges that in particular when we watch 12 angry men a lot of this is covered in that the idea that um, our personal biases can really influence how decisions are made so that was my you know again in a nutshell as much as i can fit right now but certainly i will try to be mindful about that throughout the semester um, i wanted to share something real quick on blackboard um, so this is the page where um, everything for your service learning project that builds over the semester is. A couple, couple people, bleh, can't get words out, have been emailing me their plans. And if you don't mind just going in uh, and copy pasting them here. Um, so you click write submission and put it there um, just because it helps me keep everything in one place and give you all your points. And all of the assignments throughout the whole semester will be turned in here. And I believe they should all be, I'll double check um, later today, but they should all be to where if something happens when you go to upload it, you can re-upload it. Um, that it gives you unlimited tries to upload everything. So just know this is your landing page for that. Uh, I also put in a list of some of the places people have volunteered. This certainly isn't comprehensive. Um, there are things I would not recommend that people do again. Uh, I don't think it'll be relevant this year, but for example, the last time I taught this class in person, there were um, some folks that helped with Beach Weekend uh, being like ambassadors and like had to run away from a shooting. Don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> So, you know, do things that you'll be safe doing. Let's put it that way. Uh, and then the other thing I don't think is on here that was cool that someone did is, uh, and again, might be hard in the pandemic, uh, but I know one of my students a few years back um, volunteered at one of those like safety towns, <laughs> teaching kids about police and things like that. And so uh, that was really interesting to sort of get the developmental perspective on it. So. Uh, just wanted to show you all where you turn all that in because I'm not sure it was really clear before I reorganized everything. Um, so with that being said, I'll move on to our PowerPoint for today. So let me get it in display mode. There we go. Alrighty sort of maneuver around Zoom here. Okay, so I'm gonna share screen. And again, not the most interesting PowerPoint I've ever made, but <laughs> it does give you the basic information, the terms, so you don't have to, you know, try to scramble to write those down. Um, and uh, I'm popping open the chat, so if people wanna ask questions there, you can. Um, but if you want to just unmute and say things out loud too, you can definitely always feel free to do that as well. And I will move my camera up so you can actually see my face. All righty, pass the assignment here. All right, so this is for those of you who are CJ majors, this lecture is going to be a lot of review for you. This is more for the psych majors. Um, and to be perfectly honest, those of you who are CJ majors will know a lot more about this stuff than I do. This is not my area of specialty within this. But I think it's important to cover so that we get a nice sort of um, getting us all on one page baseline of information about the legal system, at least how it operates in the US. 
um, full acknowledgement that legal systems worldwide are often quite different. And even within the US, they can be quite different. Um, and I will try to reference that as we talk throughout the semester and say like, well, this is what happens in federal courts, but it might be different than state courts, et cetera. Um, sorry, I just got distracted for a minute because it's like wintry mixing outside. So that's fun. Helps if my clicker is on. Okay. So in terms of how do we approach uh, going through the legal system. And here I'm talking mostly about how things occur when they get to the court level. Certainly throughout the semester, we will talk about the law enforcement level and we'll back it up to even how people who are in law enforcement are hired and how people in psychology uh, help with that process. But right now we're just gonna talk about issues, structures and players within the overall legal system. So um, the inquisitorial approach is used in much of Europe, but not in the UK. Um, and one thing to always keep in the back of your mind, right, is colonialism. So the US and a lot of other places worldwide were colonized by Britain, right? Well, the US wasn't the US then, right? It was. Um, I'm not going to remember the exact word in native language, but essentially they called it like mother turtle or uh, the earthland. Um, and so uh, a lot of what we have is derivative of that comes from the UK because that's how we started. So even though America tried to be really different and revolutionary, you always have to base it on something, right? And so our something was the UK system, because that's what we knew. Um, so in the inquisitorial approach, the judge has many, much more control over the proceedings than we're used to seeing in actual courts or TV shows of courts. Um, so the judge is the one who would question witnesses and the judge will actually even present evidence in an inquisitorial approach. In the adversarial system, which is what we use here in the US, um, we have exhibits, evidence, um, a witnesses being assembled by attorneys. And attorneys are the representatives of the respective parties. So it's not the judge who goes out and finds all of that, right? It's the attorneys. And they uh, are trying to assemble all this evidence, witnesses, what have you, to try to convince the fact finder that their side's viewpoint is the truthful one. So um, you will hear me use terms like finder of fact or fact finder uh, quite a bit because obviously in the US system, sometimes trials are just a judge and sometimes trials are jury, right? So we can't just be like, judge and have it applied to everything. So fact finder um, essentially is a nice substitution term for that. So I don't have to say judge or jury every time, even though there's the same number of syllables. I just feel like it's a little more awkward. So in a jury trial, judges rarely call witnesses or introduce evidence. Um, although in a bench trial, a trial without a jury, the judges do ask questions. And so our, our model for this, which obviously is a little silly, but is something like a Judge Judy show, right? So like a Judge Judy asks people questions. Uh, judge Judy is an actual judge. <laughs> uh, I remember when Trump started making nominations, someone was like, is he gonna put her on the Supreme Court? I mean, like technically she could do it. I don't think she'd want to necessarily. She's kind of got a good thing going, right? <laughs> but so that can happen, especially in um, sort of misdemeanor scenarios where the procedures are often very quick, right? Um, and the judge is the one who does the questioning. And there's even been judges who have gone viral, right, for their uh, sort of humorous style of questioning. I don't know if you all remember, I think it was like two years ago or so now, there was a judge who went viral for asking about when this woman got a parking ticket. And it was like literally 30 seconds over her time or something. So he was just like, no, we're getting rid of that. That's silly. Um, so, you know, there certainly are um, elements to that where you can see 
a judge's personality. Um, so there is, of course, criticism of the adversarial system. Uh, the biggest one is that it's a competitive atmosphere, right? You're just trying to win for your side. Um, and so that that can distort the truth rather than trying to actually find the truth, right? You're just trying to convince the fact finder that your side is the truth. But there are a lot of benefits of this system. So adversarial systems have been shown to lead to less biased decisions. So can we imagine how biased our decisions might be if we didn't have this system? That's mind blowing, right? Um, and the decisions are more likely to be seen as fair by the parties in dispute. And participants have plenty of opportunity to present their own version of the facts so that they feel they have been treated fairly. And again, this is when it's working ideally, right? And we fully recognize that it doesn't always work that way. Like the woman who stole Nancy Pelosi's laptop was like remanded to her mother's custody. Like anyone else who did that, who was BIPOC, right? Or heaven forbid, like someone of Middle Eastern descent um, would like still be in prison, never getting out. So again, fully acknowledging this is what the studies say. It does not mean it's perfect. It certainly does not mean it is not biased. All right, one of the problems that we kind of run into, and we saw this a little bit right in the Tarasov case, is what is the difference between what is legal and what is morally right, right? So like at the time, uh, the therapist really thought it actually wasn't legal or ethical for her to contact Tanya Tarasov. She thought that would be breaking confidentiality, right? So these become sometimes like a push and pull and you have to decide like at what point do you maybe go against the law to try to do what's right, right? Like, again, thinking about Black History Month, not that long ago, y'all would not have been able to go to elementary school together, right? Things along those lines. Does that mean we should have always just gone along with it because that's what was legal, right? Should Loving versus Virginia never happened? You know, biracial couple from our state, right? Because that was what was legal? No, no, right? So you kind of have to navigate that. So laws are designed to specify what is illegal. Okay, and that's called black letter law. So they're trying to specify precisely what is legal, what is illegal. And often it focuses on the what is illegal, right? It's not do these things, it's don't do that, right? But do these laws correspond to people's senses of right and wrong? Um, come, not really that common of a topic, but an example from a more modern take is, um, what's sometimes called death with dignity. So this is the choice that you do have in several, particularly Northwestern states in the US where you can choose to get essentially medically assisted suicide when you're at the end of life to not prolong it, all right? Um, and that highlights the inconsistency between what's legal and what's uh, perceived as moral, ethical, or just, right? So, um, the people who advocate for that will basically say like, why are you making me suffer? When the, everyone in the medicine, medical field has said, I can't get better, right? Uh, another argument I've seen is, you know, is this like we, again, weird analogies, fully saying this, but like we put our pets out of their misery, right? Like we let them go peacefully with euthanasia. Why can't we do that for our human loved ones? A quick side story about this, so totally illegal, but she did it anyway. Sandra Bem is a psychologist who is very well known in the field of gender. Uh, she came up with the Bem sexual inventory along with her ex-husband, Daryl Bem. The two of them remained friends and supportive, but just recognized their marriage didn't work. Um, and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And she basically made a pact with her family and said, look, when I get to the point where I recognize I'm going to start going out of my mind and not being able to make decisions for myself, I want to end it because she's a psychologist and she fully knew what was coming. So it was illegal in her state. She had obtained sort of black markety 
uh, and took an overdose of morphine. Um, and it was a decision that she and her family made. Now, there are definitely some people who say this is a huge blow to like disability rights, things like that. There are others who advocate that that was her choice, right? So it's not always perfectly clear, like, is what's legal moral? And is it moral for everybody, right? And this is where like religion and the law butt heads sometimes too. So there's the citizen sense of legality and morality. Legislatures and scholars have argued for centuries about whether or not the law should be consistent with citizen sense of morality. So researchers have asked whether the principles in the moral penal code uh, are compatible with citizens' intuitions. So researchers have considered what people thought about um, how attempted crimes should be punished, for example, versus completed crimes. Like they didn't actually do it, but they tried, right? Um, those of you who watched Tiger King, right? Like he tried to have Carol Baskin murdered, but he wasn't successful, right? So um, should we look at that in a different way than if the crime was completed? So uh, the moral penal code says that attempts should be punished in a similar way as completed crimes. That it says that intention is important. So some researchers actually found that people don't accept this view, that the intent to commit is the moral equivalent of actually doing it. Um, and so psychologists have studied how people assign causes, including intentions, to the behavior of others but then also to the behavior of themselves, right? So like, what if you were in that scenario? How would you want to be treated? So attribution theory, which is on the slide, is relevant here. So attributions are essentially thoughts, opinions we make about ourselves and about other people around us. So Attributions tend to vary along these three dimensions you see on the screen. So internality is whether we explain the cause of event due to something within the person or something that is outside of our control, something in the environment. And that can include other people. Stability is whether we see the cause of a behavior as something that's not gonna change, it's enduring, or something that's temporary. And then globalness is, do we see the cause as specific to a limited situation or applicable to all situations? So who is to blame is the internality or what is to blame? Stability is, is this temporary or is this a long lasting thing? And globality, is it limited to this situation or could it apply to any given situation? So an in, individual who chooses internal, so I am to blame, or the person who committed the crime is to blame, stable, this wouldn't have changed, and global, this would happen in any given scenario, attributions about an act of misconduct will see the offender as culpable and more deserving of punishment than someone whose attributions tend to be external, something in the environment caused this to happen, unstable, this was a one time in the heat of the moment thing, and specific, again, like something about this particular scenario is what drove this. So when making inferences about what caused another person's behavior, particularly behavior with negative consequences like crime, we tend to attribute the cause to stable factors that are internal to the person. But if our own actions lead to negative outcomes, we are more likely to blame the external environment for the outcome. So sometimes you'll hear this referred to, and I'll stick this in the chat, as the fundamental attribution area. A long time ago. I can't type and talk at the same time. So. Um, so the fundamental attribution error is 
if something bad happens to me or I do something bad, it was someone else's fault. But if another person has that happen, then it's their fault. And you can see there could obviously be racial or other discriminatory elements in this. Um, but this also can be like a little more benign. So the example I always give, which is a little silly, is let's say you uh, see someone walking around campus and you know they trip over a crack in the sidewalk. You might just be like, ooh, that person's clumsy, right? Maybe the next day you trip over the same crack and you're like, why haven't they repaired this? This is a liability, <laughs> right? So the whole idea is, um, it's a lot easier to sort of take your own perspective, right? And realize like, oh, external factors can influence this. And there can be significant consequences of discrepancies between citizens' sense of morality and the legal system's sense of legality. For the law to have any authority, it must be consistent with at least some of our shared sense of morality. When that consistency is lacking, citizens may feel alienation from authority and also become less likely to comply with laws they perceive as illegitimate. And again, this can um, eventually lead to good things, right? Like, you know, uh, Supreme Court cases that help us to do away with discrimination, or it can lead to things like civil wars, right? So this certainly can go in different directions. Now, there are different historical perspectives on justice. And in fact, when I was a first year in college, I took an entire year long course, so two semester course called the quest for justice, which started with the Bible and went all the way to modern times. So we really talked about like, how has the idea of justice evolved over time? Um, and it's certainly an interesting thing to ponder. So in the Old Testament and in Homer's Iliad, right? So we're talking about uh, texts that have been around for centuries. Justice here is essentially means revenge, right? So justice is akin to revenge. Um, it's, and this idea of justice as revenge is often related to religion. Um, tied to church proceedings. So for a lot of our history, churches were very involved in the justice system, right? Um, often the ones doing it. And this continued, I mean, really until recent history in the US. And uh, to be honest, there are places where this still happens. So examples here, uh, the Salem witch trials in the US, right? So those were religious individuals doling out justice. Um, often to people who were just different, like women who wanted to speak their mind and things along those lines. Um, and then also Galileo, Galileo, right? Being tried for heresy because of his scientific findings. One of my favorite quotes actually is by Galileo. And it says, I do not feel obligated to believe the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. I just love that because of course not, right? <laughs> or would we be given these gifts if we're not supposed to use them? Uh, so certainly we can still see this today. Could you all think of examples, again, either unmute or stick them in the chat, of ways that religion gets into our justice system or justice feels like we're searching more for revenge than fairness? I think that um, the application of the death penalty gets is very like Hammurabi-esque, an eye for an eye. Yeah, I think, you're, and especially, I don't know if anyone followed the month of December. Uh, so there hadn't been a actual death penalty completed in federal courts in like 15 years. And then the Trump administration just doled out six or seven of them, maybe more. Um, and they like, specifically picked people that it felt like revenge, right? They were people of color, they were people um, who like, everything was questionable about whether they should be eligible for the death penalty. Um, and so 
Yeah, it can feel like that, definitely. And what's one of the big religious issues that gets brought into the court system? We think about like the Supreme Court and how justices get nominated there in particular. The fact that they don't like get to leave until they die. <laughs> That's a big piece of it, right? Yeah, I was uh, thinking in particular about abortion, right? So like that's why people have been appointed either for or against for a while now because that's one of the biggest issues that still hangs over our head even though Roe v. Wade was a thing, right? Um, and so I think that that's something where we still have a religious element, again, kind of going against what scientists and medical doctors say. Um, and so we have people trying to legislate or make court decisions about things that decisions that should probably be made between a patient and their doctor, right? Um, and especially the stuff about late term abortions. Like if you're in your third trimester and you have to have an abortion, this is not something you're willfully decided. Like something has gone horribly, horribly wrong and you are probably crushed emotionally, right? So, um, and again, the lack of understanding of that, I think is really problematic. Um, and the idea that you would take that ability away from a doctor to save a pregnant woman's life um, from essentially the non-viable fetus that's eating her alive, right? That's just really disturbing. Yeah. So it does still come up in our system and that's important to acknowledge and we see it in our legislatures as well, obviously. Um, so Solon in the sixth century BCE in Athens was a poet, philosopher, soldier, merchant, economist, and social critic. And like, couldn't just check one box, man. He had to do it all. Uh, and he wanted peace and order. Um, Greece in particular, because they had these city-states, they often warred with each other. And he wanted to see this, that cycle of violence end because he recognized they were just sort of annihilating each other, right? And they were all one people. So he tried to transform the passion for vengeance that fueled those conflicts into the justice system. And the justice system was that he proposed was built on the rule of law and equality before the law. Now, fully acknowledging this was a quality of like white property owning, you know, like rich dudes, right? But again, trying to have equality for all took us a while to actually get there. We're still not there, fully acknowledge it. Um, it's also about redistribution of power through the law and resolution of conflict through a public court system with juries of the peers in an adversarial process before a presiding judge. So honestly, a lot of what we do now was really from Solon's idea. And so his idea was also to separate religion from justice. And that was the first time in human history anyone even proposed that at all. And obviously it didn't immediately make it go away. And uh, he wanted to change from the idea of private revenge to public justice. And the intent and motive behind a crime became really important issues at this point in time. So, and the, some of these were psychological in nature. And so this was really the first point at which sort of, even though there weren't psychologists, right? The ideas around uh, psychology or what would become psychology centuries later uh, became involved. And they also wanted punishment to be proportional to the crime. So a hundred years after Solon, uh, we have this guy whose name I'm not going to butcher because I never took Latin. Um, and he produced the Orestia, um, which is the tra a tragic drama, uh, and it concerned the topic of justice. And I kept the idea of humanistic justice alive. So essentially, this was a play written about Solon's system to try to like, I don't know, almost like a uh, a campaign ad or something, right? I don't necessarily want to say propaganda, right? But certainly something in support of it uh, to try to get people on board with this idea and keep it around. 
And by the time of the golden age of Athens in fifth century BCE, the concept of justice became to be more about achievement of the well-being of individuals. So again, not about revenge anymore. It's about the achievement of the well-being of individuals. During the Crusades, the Eastern Church transferred the manuscripts of Greek masterpieces to the safety of Rome. And those became the foundation of ideas, so Solon's ideas, et cetera, for European, for British justice systems. And in English society, uh, which was trying to be even more representative, they moved to the adversarial system, having juries, having the concept of equality before the law. And as I mentioned at the start of this, clearly influenced the American judicial system and the ideas about America's judicial system. So I'm gonna stop there for today because that's a nice stopping point before we end up like on half a slide. Um, but does anyone have any questions about logistics? So today your plan for um, how you're gonna get your hours is due. So this doesn't have to be exactly where you're gonna volunteer, but just sort of like, if you're gonna use hours you've already done, say that. If you are, you know, then I look for a specific type of place to volunteer at, say that. And then in a couple of weeks, what you have due is like the name of your actual sites, basically. Um, so yeah, I'll stick around for a couple minutes in case people have questions. If not, I will see everybody on Thursday and have a good night. Bye. Oh, so I actually do have a question. Sure.